wouldn't mind you taking my uh, jacket off here. It's a little warm up here in the higher elevation area. Hopefully it's comfortable out there. Well, as recorded in Exodus chapter 10, verse 3, God asked Pharaoh through Moses. I can turn this on too. We have it on. That, everybody sit up there, brother. Praise the Lord. So, as I said, it's recorded in Exodus chapter 10, verse 3. God asked the Pharaoh through Moses, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? I wonder today, to how many in this room does God's question apply? How long, lost soul, wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before God? How long, carnal, worldly, rebellious Christian, wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before God? The answer to God's question for multitudes around the world is not until the day they die. I pray that isn't an answer for anyone here today. Will you refuse to humble thyself before God until the day you die, until after your death? Everyone's going to be humble before the Lord after their death. But we're all supposed to be humble before the Lord long before we're dead. But unfortunately for so many people and so many, so many call themselves Christians, they really don't get victory over pride until after they're dead. It doesn't have to be that way, though. Every person makes his or her own choices to see whether to be motivated by pride or to be motivated by humility. My hope is that the Lord uses this message in such a powerful way that every person, every person represented here today truly chooses humility truly chooses humility by the time this message is finished. The title of our message today is The Essentiality of Humility. The Essentiality of Humility. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. For God, as we just sang in the song, our glory is not to be in self, not self-glory, but our glory should be in the cross. Our glory should be in the Lord Jesus Christ. If not for the Lord Jesus Christ, we would have no hope forever. We're so thankful, Lord, for everyone here today who has trusted Christ as Savior. They've truly trusted Christ as their Savior. That they know that if they die today, they go to be with the Lord in heaven. Lord, perhaps there's one or more here today who have never trusted Christ as Savior. Perhaps the greatest act of humility is for one to humble him or herself to reject their false beliefs and other prideful things that are keeping them from accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ, to humble themselves to do that. In one way, it's the greatest act of humility because it is the only act that results in salvation and eternal life. So, Lord, we pray if there's anyone here today who has not manifested that humility to trust Christ as Savior yet in their life, that they would do so. Lord, of course, this room is mainly populated, not totally populated by born-again believers this morning. And, Lord, uh, if any of us is humble enough, we'll freely admit that we struggle with pride, I struggle with pride, every man, woman, and child struggles with pride. It's a great part of the curse of sin and uh, the sin nature. And yet, Lord, it's something that so many don't focus on the feeding in their lives, that they just let themselves be prisoners to their pride and live out lives much in the rebellion against you because of let themselves be motivated by pride, to be being more concerned truly about self glory than about glorifying you with their lives. So I pray, Lord, that you would greatly use this message in each heart represented here today, that everyone would truly be attentive to your word, Lord, that there be a, a love, a desire for your word to be preached, and, and, and Lord, a seeking of your Holy Spirit to work mightily in, in each heart, and that decisions be made today that would help people uh, in, in, an eternal, in an eternal sense from this day forward. We pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen. So we see, first of all, that humility is necessary for spiritual victory. Humility is essential to spiritual victory. Um, I, I, I don't even have to put a, I have a slide for a guy to mention to your brother, but that's okay. We just want to use slides setting up there while I preach, and I'd rather have the light to be able to see anyway. But just that resident had on one side, uh, uh, the prideful person, and then in the middle of them, a, a, a brick or a rock wall with the word pride spelled on it, and then on the other side, the Lord. So that pride uh, results in the hardened heart, and, and we're going to see that God resisteth the, the, the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. And then on the bottom part of the slide, 
We had the, the humble person, and then the Lord, and then we have a, a double arrow pointing back and forth, demonstrating the facilitation of, of communion uh, between the Lord and uh, the, the Lord uh, greatly using us as we seek to glorify his name with, with our lives in humility. So as we go on here, I want to go to Matthew chapter 18 and verses 2 through 4. And we're going to start with the essential. The first essential of spiritual victory is, of course, to be saved. So that, uh, as I mentioned in my prayer, requires uh, humility. Uh, it requires humility. Uh, for me to get saved, I had to humble myself into uh, rejecting my previous belief that I was going to go to heaven because I was a, uh, a good person who believed in God. Uh, that, was, that, that was not going to get me to heaven, being a good person who believed in God. And I had to reject that false philosophy that I had for my entire life to, uh, to humble myself to receive the, the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And so we, we see this humility is described by the Lord as, as, as being as a, a young child uh, towards accepting what is told them by their, by their father. It says in uh, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 2, And Jesus called a little child unto, unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as his little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus reveals here that unless a person converts or turns away from pride, he or she will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's speaking about pride here. He just de they've just been demonstrating pridefulness in their behavior and disciples. And so he's obviously dealing with the issue of pride here and using a young child in receiving the, the truth of God in this. So... Uh, Jesus reveals here again that unless a person converts, turns away from pride, he or she will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we see that humility, manifesting humility is necessary, first of all, in order to, to enter the kingdom of heaven. By the way, if you are saved, you're already part of the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> you're part of the kingdom of heaven already if you trust in Christ as Savior. So the pride of self righteousness and personal philosophies and false religious beliefs and good work salvation must be replaced. By the humility of there's nothing I can do to get to heaven except for to put faith in Christ and Christ alone. That's the only thing I can do to be saved and receive eternal life. Taking your, your, your pride out of it, taking the works of man out of it, to totally put uh, your trust in the gospel of Christ and, and, and his gospel alone. It's also included, of course, his person being God himself, God the Son. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the only plan of salvation that doesn't include man's pride. Listen to that again. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only plan of salvation that does not include man's pride. The Catholic system, the Islamic system, which between the two of them is billions of people on the earth that adhere to those teachings. Uh, much of Protestantism also includes uh, false ways of salvation. So whether it be Catholic or Islamic or Whatever, all other systems of salvation include the need for man's works, man's tradition, man's religious ritual. You see, pride says that man can't, or that God can't completely save us on his own, but that every person must play a major role to obtain and to keep, and or to keep eternal life, eternal salvation. So, every other one, I remember. Trying to, in Montana, I, I encountered so many doors where there were uh, Mormon people, and they would say, I, I depend on to say this, it's, it's Jesus plus whatever else we can do. They, they just, see, it's a false gospel. It's not Jesus alone. It's Jesus plus works. And whether it's Mormonism or, or Catholicism or Islam or even much of, much of Protestantism through requiring baptism or other religious rituals. Man has a part. Because that's man's pride. Man's pride is man must have a part. I must have a part in order to bring forth my salvation. But Jesus taught that one must accept the truth of the gospel as a humble young child who simply believes what his father tells him with an open heart, untethered by the cords of pride. Simply to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that all people are sinners, as it says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
We must be humble enough to realize that we're sinners. And the Bible tells in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. So what we uh, earn for being uh, sinners is death, separation from God. I encourage folks to really pay attention here as the word of God goes forth. I always uh, try to, even though I might be tired of things, whenever I'm sitting before preaching, I want to sit and pay attention to the word of God, give respect to the preaching of God's word. Uh, and so we see that the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is Separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life of Jesus Christ our Lord, the second part of that verse says. So it's a gift. We can't earn it. The only way we can earn salvation is to live a perfect life because we've sinned even one time. We're separated from God. Oh, I never get tired. We sung that song, uh, Tell It Again, Tell It Again. I sing it as I sing that song. I never get tired of telling people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes when people start getting older like me, you know, kind of, kind of repeat stories. Maybe people heard, maybe. Two, three, four, half a dozen, a dozen times, whatever, but one story that people should never get tired of hearing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You should be able to tell it again, tell it over and over again, until we don't have any more breath to be able to tell it. It's the hope for mankind. And Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says, Thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised the dead, thou shalt be saved. So that absolute faith, confessing the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's in him, and he paid the wages of sin for us on that cross. He suffered and bled and died, taking our place on that cross to pay the wages of our sins for us. And so he took upon himself our sins. So when someone received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior through faith, it says in Romans 10 verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, then our sins are no longer regarded upon us by God the Father because they have been paid for by Jesus Christ. He's paid for them on the cross through the separation for that time from God and became sin for us. That we might be made the righteous of God in him. And so our, our sins are not, uh, spiritually speaking, uh, we're not made accountable to them because the Lord Jesus Christ paid them on our behalf. So God, uh, no one regards them unto us. And so if you have not done that, if you've not received Christ as Savior, place your faith in him and him alone for salvation. And I also not say, well, you somehow have to keep it. That's work salvation too. But it's still through him alone that we are preserved in the Lord Jesus. Christ. We're literally in his hand and not be plucked from his hand. He's all powerful. So humility is essential to obtain eternal salvation. And secondly, humility is essential to live for Jesus Christ. Here's our main point it's essential to spiritual victory, but the spiritual victory, first of all, is salvation. And then the second part of spiritual victory when someone is saved is to live for Jesus Christ. That's spiritual victory, is to live every day for the Lord Jesus Christ as a living sacrifice of the Lord, living our lives by his will and not by our own will. If you turn to Matthew again in chapter 23, and just a few chapters over, chapter 23, verses 11 and 12, we see that humility is essential to live for Jesus Christ. It says there in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 11, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Let me repeat that again. Jesus says here, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. He that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So obviously, one's not going to live a faithful life as a faithful servant for Jesus Christ without focusing on humbly submitting to God's word and spirit. It takes humility to submit to God's word and obey it. The prideful will not submit to much of God's word, will not obey much of God's word, because prideful and self, uh, you know, uh, self-focus, uh, to live by self-will and pride go together. So to live by God's will, we have to humble ourselves, continually humble ourselves, because our, our, our carnality wants to take over. We, our pride wants to uh, live life as, as the world says, as, as carnality says. So there's no way to submit to live by God's word, to be faithful and obedient to God without humility without loving him enough to humbly submit to his word and will. It's just the simplest one plus one equals two. But you see, the prideful Christian won't even have any desire to really, really have any really desire to live for Jesus Christ, except when pretending to do so for some sort of personal gain to look good or whatever. 
because they're just so imprisoned by their pride. So they really have no real desire to, to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. They want to live for themselves. So pride is very powerful and cunning and tries to convince the, the living faith for Jesus that the servant's heart uh, will result in a, a happy and unfulfilling life. When just the opposite to that is true. It says, the prophet Obadiah proclaims to the Edomites, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Uh, Obadiah preached to the Edomites, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. And that's what our pride does. It deceives us. It deceives us to reject God's truth, to believe lies. Because those lies are what our carnality longs to follow. The ways of the lies. The Spirit of God within us, if we're a Christian, is trying to motivate us to follow the way of God, to submit, and to humble, and to follow the Word of God. But our carnality at the same time is, is warring within us to go by self will, to go as the way the world teaches that one must do to be happy and fulfilled. Pride has a base meaning to rise up, to be exalted, and reality results in the Lord bringing one low and abased. Um, it's, it's true that pride-driven Christians may be exalted as far as the carnal are concerned, but carnal people, with all their worldliness and perhaps uh, money and things, but in reality, they, they're, in reality, they are abased. But by the true standard of the reality of things, they are abased, not exalted, but they will think themselves exalted because that's the world that teaches to adore and respect self-will rather than live by God's will. It's not, if you have a not a popular thing in the world to live by God's word. And that's because it's the world of pridefulness that wants to live by self-will. So it rejects God's word to live by self-will. To live by God's word is to live by God's will. And that takes humility. Pride-motivated believers are abased because they don't have the joy of salvation, which can only come with close communion with God. And that's the most precious thing that one can possess. The most precious thing we can possess is communion with God, close communion with God, a relationship with God. Uh, there's no other experience, uh, there's no other uh, type of power uh, of fulfillment, of euphoria, really, that can be felt, felt experienced in this world. Nothing comes even, comes even close to close fellowship, close communion with God. That's the highest thing that we can experience in our life. The closest we become to God is the best thing that's happening in our lives. I mean, we're either going closer to God, or we're going forward spiritually, or going backwards spiritually. There's no stagnant. There's no just sitting in one place. We're either going forward or going backward. There's no just sitting there. And so the one most wonderful thing of life is going forward, drawing closer and closer in communion with the Lord. And that requires humility. And the more humble, the more close we will come to the Lord. The more we'll submit to his word and to his will, the more humble that we become. So pride motivators, uh, pride motivated believers are also a base because of living in unfaithfulness, disobedience, and rebellion toward God, which results in negative consequences, including lack of fulfillment, depression, relationship struggles, and just problem after problem after problem after problem. After all, how can one expect life to go well when he or she is greatly living in rebellion against God? I tell you what, in my house when I was growing up, it was not uh, good for me. It was not a good life when I was being rebellious towards my parents. And I guarantee it's going to be even worse if we're rebellious towards God. We're robbing ourselves of so many potential blessings, so much spiritual fruitfulness by living in rebellion to God, by being prideful rather than being humble and humbling ourselves to live by his will, really focusing on that humility. So we, it's just not even logical to think that we're going to be blessed of God by living in rebellion against him, to live by carnality, to live by, by the world standards and expect God to bless us for that. That's not going to happen. So I've never seen it work out better for people. I've seen, I've been saved now since 1978, and I've uh, uh, been uh, have been involved in, in, in ministry and in churches since 1983. Maybe even, uh, yeah, 1983. And I've never seen it work out with somebody who turns their back on the Lord, with a family who turns their back on the Lord to follow the ways of the world. 
It may look like they're doing better for a little while, but it doesn't last long. It always comes this terrible problem because how can you expect to be blessed when you live in rebellion against God? It just can't happen. It just can't happen. You might get a lot of material things, that's true. That's not blessed. So many more important things that we'll get into in this message. So pride is a blessing stopper while practicing humility results in blessing after blessing in believers' lives. Let's look at some contrast between pride and humility with people from the Bible. Because of pride, because of pride, Cain rebelled against God, killed his brother in a jealous rage, and setting forth the foolishness of humanism, which continues to decimate society to this age. Cain, self-will. Not submit to God's will, not submit to the will of God for the sacrifice, but self-will, pride. Look at me, look what I've produced. Look what I've done. And then what did he do afterwards? He and his descendants went forth to uh, build things to their self-glory, to their comfort, to their pride, uh, cities. Humanism, and to this day, that humanistic trait permeates society and rules so many in societies, including so many Christians. We are all uh, inflicted with humanism, but we must stand up and live by God's word when despite that humanism that's so bred within us. Samson's prideful ways caused him to be abased. He became a blinded court gesture of the Philistines. When he humbled himself at the end, Samson was exalted in glorifying God. That's the first story that ever hit me. The first exposure I ever had to the word of God with some ladies in a trailer court that I was in in Montana. And I don't know, I don't think about they would have in their trailer house in, in that court, they would have a little Bible thing for kids. And I remember myself going to that thing, and the thing that I remembered is Samson, the story of Samson did in a felt thing. Man, it just hit me as a, as a, as a kid, that Samson. And I always remember how his pride and his, his evil ways caused eventually caused God to just put the hammer down on him, but in the end he humbled himself. And then he brought great glory to God because he finally humbled himself. And how, uh, how much it took, how, how terrible it took so much for him to finally become humble. Peter's pride was also even being abased as he ran away in bitter tears after denying the Lord thrice. But when Peter humbled himself, Christ sent him forth as a, as a leader of the early church. In pride, he may have even met the words and thought, but he just wasn't ready yet. And he did deny the Lord three times, even as the Lord was looking at him across the way. Those bitter tears led to humility, which led to him doing great things for God. He started living by God's will rather than self will. He started submitting to God rather than being controlled by his carnality. You see, God's word never lies. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, as we read here, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. God's word is always true and will not change. So humility is essential to spiritual victory. And secondly and lastly, humility is essential to have right fellowship with God. Humility is essential to have right fellowship with God. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13 now. In the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. And we see that hating pride is essential to being right with God. Hating, literally hating pride. Folks, we should hate pride. Because God hates pride. And we should hate pride. We should despise pride. Even though it's within our very, very hearts, we should despise it and hate it. It says there in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward forward mouth do I hate. So here the Bible unmistakably tells us that we cannot fear the Lord without hating pride. We can't fear the Lord, which is to submit to God as the rule of our lives in every way, without literally and actively hating pride. You see, pride is such a powerful force in our carnality that requires a constant acknowledgement of it and the need for us to find it. We have to be totally aware of our enemy, and our enemy is within ourselves. The enemy within is our carnality, and a huge part of that carnality is pridefulness. So we need to be aware of that enemy and be continually 
fighting against it. If you hate something, I mean if you truly hate something, knowing how hideous and ruinous that it is, you'll constantly be on guard against it rearing its ugly head in your life. And rearing its ugly head in your heart. So of course God hates pride. Pride brought ruin to heaven itself. God's not just going to make a new earth because sin uh, so brought so much ruin to earth. He's going to make a new heaven because sin also brought ruin to heaven. When Lucifer, due to pride, rebelled against God and, and also a multitude of angels with him. They rebelled against God in pride. So of course God hates pride. Brought ruin to heaven itself because the pride of Lucifer rebelled against God along with the multitudes of angels which followed him and wrought unparalleled evil and destruction throughout the world now for some seven millennia. Therefore, we should hate pride with a passion. Do you hate pride? You hate your pride. The Bible says we should. But I hate pride. However, believers often choose instead to embrace pride. Embrace it. To have a big old hug with pride. Swing the doors of our hearts wide open to its wicked wiles, allowing it to permeate every room of our psyches. So instead of humbling ourselves to the blessed guidance of God's word and spirit, we allow pride to motivate us to selfish and foolish actions and decisions which are counterproductive to the well-being of ourselves and those in our lives. I mean, one thing we just hurt ourselves is our pride. We don't just hurt ourselves. We, we hurt our families. We hurt our churches. We hurt other people in our scopes of influence. Because pride destroys. Pride brings ruin. Pride brought ruin to heaven. Pride has brought an indescribable ruin to this planet, to earth, to this world system. We should hate pride, not embrace it. So fear God by sincerely hating pride. Pride motivates rebellion against the Christ who suffered, bled, and died. To save you from hell, Christian. So think about that. Pride to motivate us, motivates us to rebel, rebel against the one who suffered and bled and died on that cross to save us from hell. The last thing he deserves from us is rebellion. The last thing he deserves for us is to respond to him in pride. No, we should be humble towards him, submit to him as the Lord of our lives. So we should hate pride. Yes, we should hate pride. And then also embracing humility is essential to being right with God. Embracing humility. So we, we saw about pride. Now, now let's look at the positive side of embracing, not pride, but embracing humility. Embracing humility is essential to being right with God. So uh, Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. Isaiah 57, verse 15, it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Let me read that again for you and make sure it's seeping into our heart. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite ones. So here God communicates a sweet and blessed communion that can only be experienced by the humble believer with a repentant heart. You see, humility motivates the holy living necessary for close intimacy with the Lord. Conversely, pride motivates disobedience and unholy living, which builds a wall of sin and heart hardness between believers and God. So let's turn to James now. James chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. James chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. In James chapter 4 and verse 5, he is inspired of God to write these words. It says, Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? 
But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Again, verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Pride comes so natural to us, so easy to us, and kind of convinces us that being selfish and arrogant is the best way to live. I have encountered so many Christians over my life that have convinced themselves that they've allowed carnality to convince themselves, the world to convince themselves that the best way to live life is by pride and arrogance. By their actions, they're displaying that. That's what they believe. But just the opposite is true. That's not the best way of life. I mean, close to it. The Bible doesn't lie. God literally resists those motivated by pride. We just read it. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud to give grace unto the humble. This is the Bible. The word of God is not some, some made-up words by some, some group of guys somewhere. This is the word of God. This is God's truth. And God's truth said that he resists the proud. Again, you didn't put any loopholes in it. That certain ones can have pride and get away with it. No, he resists the proud. The pride-driven believer may gain more of what the Satan-led world system dictates. One must have to be happy and successful. But at the same time, he has robbed himself of the incredible abundant life that can only come through faithfully living for Jesus Christ. And you see there in verse 10, humble yourself to the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. It says, be prideful, and God's going to make sure you're abased. But if you're humble, he will lift you up. So what kind of life do you want to live? The abased life or the God will lift you up life? I want to live the God will lift you up life. So what do I have to do? I have to be humble. I have to strive to be humble. And when I let my pride manifest itself and, and, and say uh, prideful things, arrogant things, or do and make prideful decisions, I need to get on my knees before the Lord and ask him to forgive me and repent of that and seek his empowerment to, to repent and, and to be humble unto the Lord, to submit unto him rather than to, to, to go forth in self-will. It's a continual fight. It's a continual fight. Just when you think, wow, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty humble guy. <laughs> no, then you'll just blow it. So we just need to just focus on this, this need. It's not something that I think the typical Christian really even considers much, but it's something that should be a continual focus of our everyday lives. God, help me to be humble. God, help me to be humble. He's trying. We need to respond. He's always trying to seek to make us more humble. Even someone as close to God as Job, he still needed more humble. So, by God's grace, the humble believer receives the blessings of blessings. The blessings of blessings. Things that money can't buy, that selfishness can't obtain, that arrogance can't garner. Things like the most wonderful experience available to mankind, as I said, close communion with God. It cannot come unless we're truly humble. Things like the incredible joys that come with truly living by faith as the Lord supplies and delivers and empowers and rewards. And things like the marvelous fulfillment can only be experienced in a right relationship with God, which only humility can bring. Even as I bring forth these wonderful things that come with being humble, the pride in people's hearts will say, well, that doesn't sound so great to me. Oh, I know those. Want the things of the world. Want the... It's true. The world doesn't really respect Christians who live like it. The world doesn't respect Christians who live by, by the Bible. That's true. The Christian, the, the world respects people who live like they do. So it's true that a, a Christian will be respected by the, the carnal, lost people. That is prideful. A prideful Christian will be respected by the carnal crowd, by lost people. But uh, we're supposed to be seeking God's approval. What we're seeing, uh, the prideful aren't going to get the world's approval, they're going to get God's approval. 
But we see God is just the prophet. We should be concerned about God's approval, not the world's approval. And that's and where pride comes in, because pride wants the world's approval. Wants the, the world's uh, respect. It wants the world's adoration. But we should be seeking God's respect and God's adoration by living according to his word. That's why the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 19, better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Let me repeat that. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. The proud Christian points to his so-called success with his worldly things, his worldly friends, his worldly respect, his worldly influence, his worldly adoration. Yet where is the spiritual success and eternal reward, the things that last forever? Where is the life sacrificing the Christ who saved him from the Christ who saved him from hell? Where is the faithfulness to worship, worship and serve God through his local church, through his church? Where is the helping of lost souls to receive the Savior? Where is the helping of lost souls to receive the Savior? Uh, the prideful Christian is so focused on helping self, glorifying self, doing for self, that they, that they, don't, they, don't, they don't have that concern. They don't have that, that desire to help lost souls to receive the Savior. They're so focused on self. So even though people all around them are headed to an eternity in hellfire, they don't love them enough. They don't, they don't, they don't want to be humble enough to risk uh, being odd, being rejected. Not having the approval of the people, so they'll literally let people just continue on that wide way unto eternal destruction. Without even care enough to shout a word of warning to them, to tell them a, a word of warning, because after all, they're too concerned about their respect, their approval, rather than God's approval. Amen. So in pride, that's why people don't witness. It comes down to pride. Of preaching, but it's reality. People don't witness their pride. What if, they, what if they react this? What if they react this this way? That's pride. But what are they going to think of me? No, what's God think of me? And He tells me to witness to Him. But no, I'm a witness. What are they going to think of me? Pride. See what an awful thing pride is. Keeps us from telling people who are headed in the eternity in hellfire what they can do not to go there. We're too prideful to tell them. I know we like to euphemize it and make other excuses, but this all falls down to pride. We don't tell them to the pride. So let's be humble and tell them. They're going to hell. Isn't that enough to make us want to be humble and tell them? That's why you can't have revival without humility. That's why the Lord starts right out there in Chronicles 7, 7 and verse 14. If my people be humble, will humble themselves. Because we won't submit to God and do what he says if we don't humble ourselves. You know, how often you hear messages on humility brought forth. Where is the testament of someone who loved God more than self and the world? In 1 Peter 5, 5, Christians are exhorted to be clothed with humility. Peter writes there, to be clothed with humility. May God use this message to move each person here to put on the clothes of humility every single day. Let us adorn our hearts. Let us adorn our hearts with the clothes of humility that we might bring immense glory, honor, and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ while at the same time magnifying his word and person to the people in our lives. Glorying in Christ and the cross, not glorying in ourselves. That's what pride does. Humility glories in Christ. Humility glories in the cross. So to be near the cross, to be near the cross, we must be humble. And using the cross as a 
picture of drawing close to God, the more humble, the more humble, the closer, the nearer the cross, and the more wonderful our lives in the truth. Let's conclude with that. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. You want revival? Humble yourself! It won't come any other way. Again, without question, the Lord demonstrates it in this verse. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Do you know why the Lord puts humble themselves first? Because if we don't humble ourselves, we will not pray, we will not seek his face, we will not turn from our wicked ways. That's why he puts humility first. Because we will not pray like we should, and we will not seek God's face like we should, and we will not turn from our wicked ways like we should, unless we are first humble. God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Have you humbled yourself to repent and trust Christ as Savior? Christian, as exposed this message from God's word today, are you ready now? to take this issue of pride and humility seriously and focus, focus as never before on being a humble, submissive servant unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that it's so. Let's go Lord in prayer. Dear God, I thank you so much for your word. And truly, Lord, we don't spend enough time teaching and preaching concerning this essentiality of humility. But Lord, today there cannot be any denying that your word is totally exposed. Pride is something we should absolutely hate and despise, even in our own selves, we should hate it. I know, Lord, the world glorifies it. Satan and his demon horde certainly glorify it. So many within Christianity glorify it. But Lord, your word is clear. You resist the proud and give grace unto the humble. Lord, if we want your grace, your blessings, spiritual fruitfulness, eternal reward in our lives. Oh, how we need to be a more and more humble people. How we need to hate pride. Not, no longer embrace pride as we're prone to do, but Lord, to reject it and hate it and instead embrace humility, which is another way to truly embrace you, Lord, and draw closer to you and sweet to you. Lord, help us now to respond, dear God, we must first be humble in order to respond to you in obedience. Oh Lord, let that be reflected even today as hearts are submitted unto you. The decisions are made to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, if there's someone here that does not know Jesus as Savior, that today they come forward and, and they would uh, be able to keep with one of our counselors and take, trust Christ as Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please, and as the panel plays, let us please respond. Humble ourselves, respond to God as he has us to.